The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Practically Magic. This is Courtney Pearl. I am a pagan witch, card reader, healer, spiritualist, Celtic priestess, teacher, artist, and mystic mythical seeker. On this podcast, I've discovered true and real magic that I wish to share with you and with the world. Welcome. I was just getting back from an art workshop that I was doing with my friend Sarah at Daybreak Treasures Boutique. She does some excellent watercolor workshops, so I'm feeling nice and refreshed and ready for our topic today. If you've been following along the last couple of episodes, we have been doing a little bit of a focused attention around the three aspects of spells that I talked about in the first episode. So we have done an episode on the words. Last week, we got to dive a little deeper into the will, and today we're going to talk about the way. First, we're going to start out by pulling a card for this episode. I'm very excited to introduce another new deck. This is not a tarot deck. So tarot has its own major arcana and suits and numbers cards, each with its own meaning. This deck that I'm going to pull today is a new deck that I got. It's an oracle deck. Oracle decks can be themed and all have their own meaning. Each card is a different meaning. And Oracle decks are kind of like what I describe as my gateway to tarot. So if you're not ready to commit to studying tarot and understanding tarot, then Oracle decks are for anybody. And today I am going to pull from a deck that I just got, Seasons of the Witch. And this one is the Imbolc. And if you don't know, in the Wheel of the Year or the Pagan Wheel of the Year, there are certain holy days or markers of the seasons. Every six weeks is a different holy day. So it's kind of like getting to celebrate something every six weeks weeks of the year. Kind of makes the year broken up into a nice, tidy amount of time to get through the seasons. And they often fall in line with the harvesting and planting seasons of the year. So it's basically coinciding with, in pre-Christian times, what we would have marked occasions throughout the year. So Yule is the winter solstice, and it's when the festivals of Yule would happen. And during February, we begin February by celebrating Imbolc. Or we're celebrating St. Bridget and the goddess Bridget, who is the same person, but one is from a Christian background, naming her as a saint, and one is that she was a pagan goddess. Any way you look at it, it's it's Bridget's time. It's her special time. And so I am going to pull one from this because then it aligns with kind of the time of year that you are potentially listening to this episode. Okay, so I'm pulling a card. It's number 35 in this deck, and it is called Rosemary Bread. And it has this beautiful picture of this mom and daughter, it looks like, who are baking bread in a kitchen. And it looks extremely cozy, and it's a wooden table with bread makings and vegetables in bowls. And they're sitting and making bread. And it's significant in this understanding that it's rosemary bread because rosemary is an herb and it and so when we are understanding this card for us today it's like a call to action that gathering during holy days whatever your holy days are whatever days you celebrate or think of as important to you and traditional to you That that gathering is a sacred space. And Rosemary, it says, share commune with the ones who mean the most to you. Break bread with the spirit of Rosemary, which will call for healing and mending. It's about relationships. It's about gathering with those that you choose to gather with in love and harmony. And that is going to tie nicely into our topic today. 
And I'm excited to go into this topic of talking about how when we're creating spells, we actually need to have several components in place. And remember, from the other episodes, we talk about spells, but we talk about them as all spells are just stories. But you can replace the word spells with prayer, intention, living your life meaningful and with direction, seeking what it is that you want. And we're all writing spells, whether we know it or not. We're writing spells because we're writing stories. Everything in our mind and body and how we work is directed by stories. Some of them are stories and thoughts and beliefs that we keep within us, and some of them are outwardly exposed in the mythologies and the faith practices that we use in our life. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story from my own come from as I have been studying Welsh mythology and getting connected with Welsh spirituality and Avalon as a spirituality. The story that we just got done studying in our in my group is Arianrud. And you may not have heard of Arianrud. She's not one that we grow up learning about when we're learning in school about Greek mythology and characters of mythology. Welsh mythology is a little bit buried in if you were growing up in in Wales, you might have heard these tales told in your grade school. But it's not something that we get to hear about very often. So that's why I'm going to bring her forward today and talk about the story as we go into today's topic. So just as a brief overview of her story, she gets a lot of a, she gets a kind of a bad rap because in her story, and her story starts well before she even comes into it. So there's a whole story that goes before her story. But basically there's a king. And this king, for whatever reason, it doesn't explain because some of these old ancient stories don't make a lot of sense, but he needs to um, have his feet in the lap of a virgin. And if he does not place his feet in the lap of a virgin, he will die. And the only time he's not allowed, he's not required to have his feet in the lap of a virgin is when he is in battle. And he comes back from battle and the young maiden he had previously had his feet in. She has had some unfortunate circumstances happen in the story, and she is no longer a virgin and cannot hold his feet for him. So here he is asking his court, is there any other maidens that are virgins that would be able to do this job for me? And Ariamrud is his niece, I believe, in the story. And she comes forward and says, I have that ability to do that for you. And he says, well, I'm going to put my magic wand. Now, you can take that symbolism to mean whatever you want. There is a lot of debate as to whether or not his magic wand is really a wand. But he is a magical being in the story. He is somewhat of a magician. So it makes sense that he has a magic wand. So we'll go with that. He takes his magic wand and he places it on the ground. And he said, just to test to make sure that you are a worthy virgin, I would like you to just hop over this wand. It'll be a test. So she gladly does it, expecting that everything will go just according to plan. But when she hops over this wand, something strange and amazing happens. These two sort of creatures fall out of her. And it surprises her and scares her, and she runs away. Well, these two creatures, one is a child, and the child is named by the king, and it goes, he, he's named Dylan, he goes into the ocean and becomes an ocean god. And this other creature, they're not sure what it is, but it's very tiny, and they just wrap it up into some cloth, and they put it in a chest, and Ariane Rood's brother, Guian, is, Guidin is the caretaker of this thing, and it does grow into a baby, and it becomes a baby, and it becomes a child, that he raises. But in the story after that, it gets a little crazy because, well, as if that wasn't already crazy enough. If you're listening to this story and you're like, what in the world? This is the most insane story I've ever heard. Well, that's Welsh mythology for you. It's full of a lot of twists and turns and magical and strange things. But as the story goes on, Arianrud is 
met up with her son. And in the story, she's so upset to have him brought back to her. She says, this shame has been put back upon me. And she says, I will, he will have no name save for the one I give him. And her brother who is raising this boy is like, oh, you wicked woman. How dare you? He is your son. How could you do this to him? He needs a name. You are supposed to give him a name. And she says, no, he will have no name except the one I give him. And so the story goes on. He has to trick her into giving this boy a name. He has to disguise himself and the boy. And they trick her into giving him a name. And she's upset by this and says, Okay, then he will have, he will bear no arms save for that I give him. So, again, this is significant in the symbolism of the story because uh, a young man, this story was written in something like 1100. It's much older than that, but that is when it was actually written down. And in those times, a boy becoming a man could not be called a man until he had, he was able to bear arms. So she's keeping that from him. And then, again, she's tricked into giving him a sword and all of these things happen. And lastly, she says, well, then he shall have no wife save for that I give him. Or she actually says, he shall have no wife of this earth. And that's symbolic because a man would not have a title or a place in society unless he was able to get married. So she's keeping that from him. Now, this story, again, she gets a bad rap because for people just listening to the story as it's told, would just believe her to be this terrible mother. What a terrible mother she is. She's not allowing her own son the right to have all of these things that he deserves to have. And the class that I was taking about this particular mythology proposes that in Celtic studies, when they are learning about this story, it's proposed that Ariane is not a bad mother, but maybe she is actually representative of a sovereignty goddess. A goddess or a lady in stories of this time period would have been the one who tests the king in order to prove that he is worthy of holding the crown, of being king over the realm. And the lady represents the land. So she's the lady who is testing her son and giving him these challenges in order for him to overcome them and prove that he is the rightful heir to the throne. Because in this story, her uncle being king, and in this time period, the, the inheritance of the, of the king would have gone to the maternal line. So it would have been the niece, Ariane Rud, her son, would inherit the throne. And this is her way of possibly testing him and making sure that he has, has proven his place, that he can have a name, that he can have bare arms, and that he then has a wife. And how he gets a wife is a whole other story, but it's a magical and amazing tale. And I'm just paraphrasing the story today and not giving you all the little details, but that can be found in the Mabinagi if you're interested in reading more about that story. It's it's an amazing story. And I love Ariane Rude because she represents this putting action into place in the story to make the things happen that need to happen. And sometimes that means the challenges that are faced throughout the way. Adversary and challenges and obstacles are the tasks that we complete in order to claim our sovereignty over what it is we have sovereignty over our life. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today as we talk about the way. So when I am talking about the way we get things we want, I'm not necessarily talking about the plan. Of course, when we are wanting wealth, prosperity, actively good, intimate relationships, connection, Whatever it is we're looking for, there are plans in place to have those things happen. And of course, we are planning out our lives to hope for those things. We want to become an engineer, so we go to school to learn engineering. We don't just sit around saying, well, 
I want to be an engineer, so I just hope that happens someday. There is a way to that, but I'm talking specifically about creating the rituals and practices that bring the things and opportunities we want to us. How do we bring those things into the physical world? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about creating rituals. Creating rituals in our life does not have to be a chore. If anything that you're trying to put into your daily practice or life to connect yourself with the energies you want to be connected with, it shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be something that you have to talk yourself into. It should be something you're excited and motivated to do. So the first rule to creating a ritual is nothing so complicated or out of the daily habits you have that would make it cumbersome. It should be something that you can implement into your life easily. So here's some examples of some really simple rituals you probably already do and don't even realize it. So a ritual could be something like checking the weather by walking outside and feeling it rather than asking your Alexa or your Surrey like, hey, what is the high temperatures today? What is the weather supposed to be like today? You are figuring out what to wear. You're figuring out how to plan your day or what it is you want to do that day. A ritual of connecting with the weather in a physical sense, walking outdoors, breathing in the air, connecting with how that feels to you, that should all be a natural way that you connect with the outside. Excuse me. Another one could be gratitude actions. So if you're already writing in your gratitude journal or you're pointing out things in your life that you are grateful for, noticing them throughout your day, that can already be a ritual in place. But you might even give yourself some actions, physical body actions that you do when you say, I am so grateful for this. Putting your hands on your heart and taking a moment to notice all of the things around you that you have already. I really want to be wealthy. That's something that I'm putting out there into the universe. I want wealth. I want abundance. But my ritual or my gratitude ritual in this moment is going to be to stop and notice how I already am wealthy. And I'm going to put my hands on my heart or I'm going to use my five senses and look around me and just name all of the things around me right now that I'm grateful for. For me, A great ritual that I love to have in my daily life is waking up every morning and I do my morning pages, which I talked about in the episode about the words. I do my morning pages and I also love to pull a card or two or three from a specific deck that I keep on my, um, it's a deck that I connect with personally and I don't use it for readings out in the public, but I love to just pull a card for my day. It's also a great way to learn tarot and oracle cards and get comfortable with them is just have a daily practice of pulling cards and reading them for yourself. So if you are interested in cards and divination anyway, it's just a great ritual to have. But I like to do that just to get a measurement of my day. How is magic in this sense going to show up in my day? And how am I going to go through my day with this new knowledge? Another thing that I have adapted as a ritual into my life lately has been how I actually interact with the outside world. That in order for me to be grounded and connected with earth and the energies of earth, I need to be connected to the land. And I am going to do a full episode just on land connection because it is a really important part of using magic in your life. You and the land are not separate beings. We are all interconnected. And interconnection is a Buddhist practice, by the way. Just knowing that we are so connected to everything around us, you can't possibly do magic in your life and not feel that connection and that interconnection between all things. So I learned some really great rituals just in doing what I already do when I go out and weed the garden or I'm planting new seeds in the spring. I'm helping and watering those seeds, helping them to grow, and when I'm planting and harvesting them. 
And I have incorporated this in my family with my family in the way that we practice is I make sure that we are deeply connected with those beings. So I don't just plant the seeds. I plant the seeds with an offering. I might take a feather that I found or coffee grounds from when I made coffee in the morning and I plant that into the soil. And I intentionally tell the plant that this is an offering for them and that I continue to offer them as they grow. When I'm watering those seeds, I talk to those seeds and I talk to those plants and I tell them how much I love them and how grateful I am for them. And I I ask them their name and I I connect with them. And I can understand how that might all seem very strange. I can understand how a very logical, practical person might look at that and say, oh yeah, I get it. You talk to trees. You're one of those weirdos. But if it's scientifically proven that when we talk to plants and give them our love, they grow better, maybe the indigenous peoples who practice these kinds of rituals in their daily life and was just part of their spirituality, maybe they had something. Maybe now that science is catching up to the idea that trees are incredibly intelligent and that they talk to each other through their root systems and through electrical impulses in the fungus around the root systems, maybe we all already knew this and we have forgotten it because we're a little too practical to believe it. And then, of course, when I harvest those gardens, when I harvest my fruits and vegetables, I make a ritual and practice out of thanking them. Or even, and this is really important, asking permission to harvest those things. Because if I have a connection to that plant, it would be incredibly disrespectful to walk up to a plant and just start picking the tomatoes right off of it. Can you imagine what that would be like if somebody just came up to you and was like, these are mine, I deserve them, I own them. They are mine. We have a more symbiotic relationship with the plants and the animals and the um, earth and land around us. So I have incorporated even just gardening and taking care of the land and my own yard as a ritual or practice. Another way to consider using rituals in, in inviting the things that you want into your life, consider the symbols that you want to have. Consider the five senses you want to incorporate into the ritual. So what do I want? What taste do I want to have in this ritual? Am I marking a certain occasion? What is the purpose of this ritual? Am I celebrating something and asking for something? Consider what symbols, plants, animals, colors, stories, mythological characters, people, places, generations, elements, deities, crystals. There are so many different things that hold vibrational frequency. So when I'm creating a ritual or a spell around something that I want, I am taking into consideration, what do I want to have in this ritual? What do I want to incorporate as part of it? So I ask myself, what's the purpose of this ritual first? I say, what sort of symbols and tastes and senses do I want to incorporate into this? And then what movement or action do I want to put into it? That might include having a fire, having a fire pit or a fire going. You can write something down to burn in the fire or to rip up into little pieces and let the wind take away. You can dance to certain music. You can walk. You can bow. There's a reason a lot of very sacred moments in all kinds of different faiths, they either kneel on the ground or they bow because it is humbling yourself completely and giving to your higher power something that you are asking for. Or even going to a specific location, if it was high on a hill and you feel closer to to nature or to a higher being when you're in that location, then that might be something special to you. For me, location can be something like a cave, which is where I'm broadcasting right now. I'm in my cave, which is my sacred spot. Because to me, it feels like being in a womb. And those all can be incorporated 
in whatever rituals you're planning on doing or how you want to mark this occasion or how you want to ask for this thing that you want to do. All right, so I'm going to put together something like if I was to create a spell or put together something that would help me improve relationships with my spouse. And this is the example I'm going to walk you through. And you can incorporate this in any kind of a spell or thing that you are looking to ask for. I'm going to walk you through how to go for the will, the words, the will, and the way, and how we're going to actually take that all the way through. So this is a spell I'm creating myself. I didn't pull up any other resources, but you can. There's a lot of resources out there. There's spell books, there are symbols, and you can get a lot of resources out on the internet or in in those in those places. But this is just me writing down what it is I want to do for me and what works for me. So I want to improve the relationship with my spouse. Obviously, there are a lot of psychological and practical things I can do to improve my relationship with my spouse. Those are things I want to incorporate into my life as well. But let's just say I wanted to create something that was just helping me get into the right frequency to be able to attract that kind of love and intimacy between us. First, I would sit with the words. I might write them or say them, but I would say, I'm going to write down, my husband is a devoted father, considerate human being, and a fantastic lover. Or I could write, or I could say, wouldn't it be lovely if my husband was listening to every word I said and was devoted to making me happy above all other things? Blah, 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 blah. Whatever I want to say, okay? I'm making this up as I go along. So it's just, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if are the magic words. Now, when I get to the will, that's where I really got to do the deep down work. I am going to start taking notice of all of the times, maybe write down 10 times in a week, where all of those things that I want him to have might actually be happening. Just taking notice of it. We talked about in the last episode, if you say, I'm going to take notice of every time today that I see a red car. You are going to actively see a red car way more, way more red cars on the road than you would have if you had not been taking notice of it. It's not that those red cars didn't already exist. It's just you weren't noticing it. So I am bending my will to notice all of the times when my husband really is a devoted father and a good listener and devoted to me. I can also write in my gratitude journal, every night some evidence of things that have he's been actively doing those things already perhaps i need to do some inner healing work which is of course some of that emotional processing we talked about in the last episode i'm going to work on that and i'm going to work on what sort of blockages i might have that are keeping me from believing i deserve my spouse to be there for me what might be blocking the energy so that i can't receive that particular thing, that particular experience. I might write love letters to myself as if they're from my husband or from love itself and just write those love letters out and say, love is always with me. I am worthy of love. Or just the most romantic love poems that you can think of as if you're writing them to yourself. That is already going to put yourself in that vibrational frequency of feeling in love. Reminding yourself of all the reasons that you fell in love. And helping you discover what self-love really is. That we're not just seeking love from other people, but that we really feel it within ourselves. It's felt. It's not given. And then finally, I'm going to go with the way. So today's episode was about the way, and this is creating some kind of a ritual or habit that brings forward love in my life. And this is what I came up with just when thinking about this. I thought, well, you could always draw a bath and put rose petals in it, like you're making yourself your own little love potion in a bath. Using rose quartz crystals are always very associated with the love soft lighting, 
using pomegranate seeds in honor of Persephone as the goddess of spring. And I always associate her with love because I think she is a very loving goddess. So that is a character I'm incorporating into my love spell, into my intimate spouse relationship spell. And then I might listen to love songs that are particularly personal to me, that make me feel loving and remind me what being loved feels like, like when you first fell in love with your husband or when I first fell in love with my husband. So that would be all my responsibility. It's all in my power to create that love spell, to do the words, the will, and the way. None of this is actually including my spouse into any of it. It's trusting the universe or God or my higher power or whatever your belief system might be that this work is laying the groundwork for me to accept what is coming, what is going to eventually be. Now, let's just say I do all that and I'm feeling great and I am feeling all that love. And my husband hasn't been a participant or even aware of any of it going on. It's an experiment to see what happens. Does he start reacting to me differently? And I guarantee he will only because you have raised your vibrational frequency and already feel that loving embrace before you've even gotten it. So maybe he doesn't change at all. Maybe he doesn't change his behavior at all. Maybe he's so oblivious he doesn't even notice that you have changed. Maybe. But don't you already feel better and great and amazing as if you're in love, as if you've already gotten all the love you've ever needed? And all you did was all that work with yourself. Even if he doesn't change at all, doesn't have any notice whatsoever. And you might be thinking, well, what's the point in that? Isn't it a spell to get him to do this thing that I want him to do? No, because spells are not about changing other people. Spells are about changing you. Spells are about rewriting the stories within yourself. Rewriting the story that says, I deserve love. I already have love. I feel love just by existing, right? And now that's going to tie us really, really wonderfully into our question from a listener. So I actually had this question asked of me by a a client that was coming into uh, Synchronicities where I work on Wednesdays. I was just hanging out in the uh, gift shop. They have a really great collection of crystals and metaphysical things in their shop. And I was hanging out there and someone walked up and said, you know what? I have a wedding coming up for a friend and I am wondering what is a great wedding gift to get them? Is there a certain crystal that or group of crystals that I can get them, that would be a great wedding gift. So I love that question because it goes right into the spell we just created. And what I came up with, and I was doing some research on this, I do a lot of work with crystals myself. I love the crystals. Each and every crystal has its own specific vibrational energy. So they are great supports for when you are looking to raise your vibration, carrying crystals around. Um, or having them around or having a space where you set up a little devotional space to what it is you're looking for. And we didn't talk about that a lot today, but that's another way that you can create the spells is having an altar space, having a space in your house that you do your devotional work or that you tap into that. And just dedicating a space is a really great way to, to have the way to create that way, that practice. But crystals are awesome for that. So I love having, I have a particular bottle that I, it has a space in the bottom that you can unscrew and the crystals go in the bottom. It's a separate space. And then you can unscrew the top and pour water in. So your water is getting infused with the essence of those crystals. And whatever I put in the bottom, I can drink up the water. And again, I will talk about that more when we talk about water magic. But My recommendation for this listener when looking for a wedding gift, I have a couple of different things I think would be amazing. Of course, rose quartz comes to mind first thing because it is pink, the color of love. And rose quartz is a cleansing. It 
it banishes away all that negative energy or anything that might be uh, hanging around. So it's awesome to put in different locations around the house and clear the negativity from that space. I also discovered Dalmatian Jasper, which is a grounding stone, but Dalmatian Jasper is particularly good for relationships, I found out, which is awesome. It looks like a stone that is black and white, and it has yin and yang energy. Yin and yang is the Chinese masculine and feminine. So it is basically the symbol of balance. And when going into a marriage, I can't think of anybody that might not benefit from balance. Balancing out the relationship or the energy between masculine and feminine. And by the way, that's not just because marriage is man and woman. I'm talking about energies. So any one person can have masculine and feminine energies. Everybody has that. And balancing those two energies within us is a really great way to heal. So Dalmatian and Jasper is great for that. Also, orange carnelian is particularly great for sacral chakra, and that has to do with relationships. So the balance between the relationships and making sure that there isn't codependency patterns or clearing out codependency patterns between the relationship is a really great idea. Sacral chakra also has a lot to do with fertility. So if that marriage was needing a little boost or a a little help in the fertility department, that might be a good one. And anything that's green is associated with the heart chakra and love. So green ad aventurine or malachite are going to be great for that going into a marriage. So if that helps answer that question, you've got a wedding coming up and you need some ideas, those are my, my recommendations. And of course, those that are very specific in the knowledge of crystal healing would probably have even more that would be amazing. So you are always welcome to write in your, your ideas and your questions. All right. We went a little bit long today. This was a lot to talk about with the story time and all the things that we had to go over. But if you stuck in there with me, thank you so much for listening. And I am so excited to announce that next week I will have a guest. My first guest interview is going to be with Cambria Davis from Kaya Community. And she's going to be talking to us about the magic of astrology. Astrology is a whole other realm of healing and, and energy work. And just it's an incredible tool to use. It's not something I have very much knowledge at all about because it's so complicated. And I am such a specific have specific knowledge in the things I've learned about, that feels like a whole other degree. And so I am really excited to talk to her about bringing in her knowledge on that and how that incorporates into the magic we use in our everyday life and how learning astrology can help us. So please stay tuned for that. That's going to be an amazing episode. And please remember to try to be mindful about the magic that is all around you. Your call to action this week is to just be more aware of real magic. Stop every once in a while to smell the roses because even in the roses, there is magic. We use magic every day in our lives to strengthen relationships, to heal, to prosper, to thrive. And I want that for you. All right. If you want more information on this and any other subjects, can be found on my social media on at Prism underscore healing on Instagram at prism underscore healing. I am on Facebook as Courtney Pearl and I have a website. You can find more information and all of the resources that I've talked about in this episode and other episodes on my blog. You can also see my services that I offer on prism-healing.com. And of course, I want you to private message me anytime you have a question about this or anything having to do with healing, anything magic or energy, and I can feature those questions on our future episodes from listeners. Today's resources, I would like to give a shout out and a thanks to my teacher and guide, Channing Parker, who gave me a lot of the resources on how to create a ritual. And from the book Root and Ritual, which is, talks a lot about connection to land. 
I would like to thank Ride the Wave Media, Just Blaine and Bex, and Daybreak Treasures Boutique for featuring me as an artist and sponsoring my events. And I hope to see you next time right here, Practically Magic. 